chapter 6. We're going to be spending uh, time there. Also in time, we'll be spending in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I mentioned that already. So go ahead and open your Bibles. We are continuing with a series called Money, Sex, and Power. And we got through the money part, and now we're on the sex part. And uh, we're talking about what the Bible has to say in these things. We find that those three areas, money, sex, and power, are all blessings from God, but they're often the three things that are abused and misused that cause conflict in our world today. Right? And look what's going on with the wars going on. Look at Putin, what he's doing uh, over there in Ukraine. He wants power. Then you have situations with sex misconduct. You have uh, power issues, money issues. It goes around and around and around. And so I think it's pretty important that we learn how to deal with these issues. And so the Bible has a lot to say about them, and, and we've been talking about sex and what the Bible has to say about sex. It might be a little PG-13, but it should be okay. If you don't like it, um, we do have some, uh, you can go to Sal's house or uh, release your kids to the kids' church. But I think it shouldn't be as spicy as last week, okay? I took a little cayenne pepper out of there, so it shouldn't be quite as bad. Um, well, let's go ahead and, and, and review a little bit. First of all, I wanted to mention to you, it's so important that we get this down, and if you memorize Scripture, you need to memorize Romans 8.1. If you don't memorize Scripture, you need to memorize Romans 8.1. There, therefore, there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. The, the topic we're talking about is an area that brings a lot of shame to a lot of people for various reasons. And just remember it this way. If, if you're feeling down like, I might as well give up, that's not God. That's either yourself or the enemy. If you feel like, yeah, I messed up, but there's a, there's, a brighter head, there's a brighter day ahead. God can help me through it. That's conviction. There's a vast difference between two of them. And there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. So please, when we talk about these things, you may have messed up big time. Understand that God is a God of new beginnings. He's a God of new creations. And though there might be damage, there might be a pain in the past, there is a time for a new beginning. I wanted to say that before we get to this topic every week because it's important we understand that. The second thing I want to mention as in review is that guess who created sex? God did. God made it. It wasn't the enemy. He designed it. It's a wonderful thing in the confines of marriage. It's designed for marriage. It works in marriage. Outside of marriage, it's destructive. It's like me lighting a fire in the middle of this room here without a place to put it. It causes destruction and all kinds of difficulty. And so that's important. You see, we often want to warm ourselves with a fire. But if you put the fire in the wrong place, I never ever forget a number of years ago, I was reading a story about a man that uh, put his children in a, in, a, uh, in a van and lit a kerosene heater to warm them up. They all, end, they all end up dying. Why? The desire was right. They warm up, but it was in the wrong place. Sex in the wrong place can kill, destroy, and it has done that and is doing that throughout our country and throughout our world. It's important we understand that. And then we also talked about why sexual sins are worse than others. And I wanted just to review that a little bit, please. If you could open your Bibles, 1 Corinthians 6, 16 through 20, it says the following. <clears throat> or do you not know that he who is joined with a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Now, before we get to there, the Bible says that you come one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Here we're talking about one of the most close relationships you can have is sexual intimacy through marriage. And right after that, he talks about being in union with God. Now, I know it sounds kind of strange, but don't take it the wrong way. I believe sex in marriage is a signpost of what's to come in heaven. In other words, the, the, the wonderful intimacy, the enjoyment, is pales in comparison to what we're going to have with God. In other words, our relationship with God is going to be so much better than anything here on earth. And the closest thing we have here on earth in that regard is often through sex and marriage. So it's pretty neat that the God says that. In many ways, Sandra and I, yesterday we went to see somebody that was on, on death's door. They weren't in our church. They're ready to die. We're ready to die, and they're right with God, thank God. And we basically said, it's like you're in the womb. This earth is a womb, and you're going to be birthed into everlasting life. And so we don't even know how great it's going to be out there. And so anything we're experiencing in the womb of life, it's so much better when we're birthed into eternity. So understand that God has good things for us, and he designed sex. And it was really interesting because in church history, St. Augustine, if you know who he is, he wrote Confessions in the City of God. He was a very promiscuous uh, in his early years, and he, got, he became a believer. And he was really wrote scathing remarks about sex, even in a marriage. 
And so what happened was the Catholic Church kind of picked up that thing, sex is bad, and it just kind of happened over and over again. And it's something that God has designed, it's something that is good, something that helps marriages, something that's important in marriage, and it was kind of made to be shameful. It's not shameful at all. And we have to, it's a tragedy to make it shameful, and it's a tragedy to take it out of context. So that's all part of it. And I also mentioned last week, just to kind of help us, I mentioned the fact that the Bible says the two shall be joined. The word joined has a connotation of glue. And we mentioned last week, I had a Hispanic man that's losing his hair. Just to be fair, because, I, you know, I'm losing my hair. Okay, that's beside the point. And we had the, the woman here who said the two shall become one. When they come together, something happens. The two shall become one. But when you pull apart, we mentioned the fact that often this is what the result is. You have shards of each other left on each other. And if you've ever been through a relationship that broke up, such as divorce or a close relationship, you know what I'm talking about. It's like someone rips your heart out of your chest. The pain of it. Why? God did not design us to be going like this, constantly doing that. And so many people have five or six people, they're involved in a relationship before they meet the right one. Why want to go through all that for? The reason why God said not to do this is because he loves us. And he doesn't want to see us hurt ourselves and hurt other people. And so we mentioned that as well. It's a kind of a vivid example to remember that. And so let's continue to read and review and then move on from there. It says, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. You see that? It actually hurts you. Every other sin is outside the body, but he who sex sin, uh, sexually sins against his own body. Remember, the enemy's job is to kill and destroy. He wants to hurt God's creation. And here the Bible says, he who sins sexually sins against his own body. So if you're the enemy, you want to hurt people, what do you want to do? Go to the thing that hurts the most. Go to the juggler of humanity. And the juggler of humanity is often sexual sin. All we have to do is open the paper and see what's going on, or open your e emails, or open the uh, website. You see the, the sin around the world and the disease and all that is caused from that. All the psychological damage all the emotional damage, domestic violence, a lot of it centers around a, a misuse of sex in general because it's really only made for sex in marriage. So we talked about that. And uh, do you know, and the Bible says here, flee it, flee sexual immorality, which we'll get into today a little bit more. Every sin that man does outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Listen to this. And do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, from whom you have from God, and you are not your own. For you were bought with a price. Therefore, I glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. I know that might sound, for those of you checking out, is this thing really for me? Christianity, is, is, the church, is God really real? It sounds kind of exclusive. I don't like that. I mean, you're not your own. Well, the truth is, if you're, if you're living for yourself, you're living for the enemy. Because you cannot satisfy yourself because you're not God. You were made by, you hear me say this almost every week. You're made, you're made by God for God. And until you live for God, you're going to hurt yourself and other people. We're designed to be in relationship with God. It works. Without God, there's something faulty in what we're doing. And we're going to eventually hurt ourselves. And so it's not hateful or exclusive. It's the right way. And why across the world are people searching out God in different cultures? Why is there such a longing? Because we're made for God. We're designed for God. We're wired for God. And we need to listen to what God says because he loves us. And he wants what's best for us. So we also mentioned about great sex being married and the potential of being single having great sex. You know how you can prepare yourself for great sex being single? By being pure. By being the right person. By saving yourself for when you get married. And today, we're also going to share a little bit about being single. Do you realize it's not a sin to be single? Do you realize that Jesus was single and fulfilled the purposes of God in his life? The apostle Paul was single while he wrote these letters. We think he might have been married before. We don't know, but it seems like he probably was. But nevertheless, he was single. He talked about that. So please understand that. We're going to talk about how the, today's title is simply this, sexual purity, being singled, and being married. All of us are called to sexual purity, no matter if you're single or you are married. So let's go ahead and bring a little bit more of a context today. If you could open your Bibles, please, now to Matthew chapter 5. Uh, Jesus uh, says something here that's very disturbing. And if I was going to be selective, I might cut out the second parts of these verses because it really is not very politically correct, and it sounds hateful. 
But as you listen to me and look and listen to the spirit of Christ in this, it's not hateful. It's called design, and it's called healing. So let's go ahead and see what the Bible has to say. Starting at verse 28. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her in his heart has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Very interesting that Jesus goes beyond the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments says, do not commit adultery. Jesus says, you know what? Before you commit adultery, you already premeditate it most of the time. Usually it happens, it goes from your head to your heart to your hands. And so Jesus dealt with it right up here, right up here. He knew that's the most important place. And so what does he say? He says, you should not commit adultery. But, uh, but I say that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And I've heard this, by the way. I'm going to bring it up again because I've heard this growing up. When I was in youth group or when I was in college and Christian groups, hey, listen, you know, the Bible says if you look at lust, you've already done it. So I'm no worse than you. So I, know, I sleep with my girlfriend, but I know you've looked at girls. So you and I are the same. And so, you know, in that case, I might as well go all the way since it's already sin. I know you laugh at it, but isn't that kind of the, the rationality we often use? Well, the truth is, that God is perfect and we're not. And no sin can face a holy God. There has to be a bridge. And so whether you lust in your heart or you do it in person, yes, it's both sin, both fall short. But how many folks know there's collateral damage is changed by the different actions? The degree of collateral damage is different from thinking it in your mind and actually doing it. Now you're involved in another person. Now you've actually acted out what you thought about, and it has more gravity on this side of heaven. It's still sin. It still separates you from God. But for someone to say that is nonsense. You see how the enemy, isn't it amazing how we kind of rationalize stuff? We kind of, you know, oh, well, it's not that bad. I guess it's the same. You hear about the spin room at press conferences? Well, we have a spin room in our mind. The enemy comes out and he spins sin and tries to make it seem like it's okay. I mean, after all, it's only an affair. No, it's adultery, you know? I cheated. No, you committed fornication, you know? And it's amazing how we often change the wording. So the Bible is very, very clear, and Jesus is very clear on this. Now, here's some really sobering words I'm going to read to you next. He says, I'll read it again, but I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. I read stories of people literally doing that. That's not what Jesus is saying. No one cut off your hand. No one plucked your eye out. But he's using that as a vivid example. And he says, remember we mentioned 1 Corinthians, flee sexual morality. He says, don't play games with sexual immorality. It will burn you. It will kill you. It's like the, it's going to really hurt you. So don't play with it. He's saying he who does that will destroy their souls. Are you saying a person can lose their salvation if they do that? I don't, what does the Bible say there? Then you've got to ask yourself the question. You're going to say, God, I don't care what your word says. I'm going to do it my way. Then I wonder if you really have given your life to Christ. You may believe in Christ. You may believe in he rose again from the dead, but he's not the Lord of your life. See, that's a vast difference. We all make mistakes, but usually if the Holy Spirit's in you, you want to get, get back right with God. But if you're just going headlong, I'm going to sleep with who I want to sleep with. I don't care. I'm going to do what I want. The Bible says you're in danger of hell. And by the way, this is, kind of, this is going to mess with some of your theology. He's not talking to people outside the church. He's talking to a religious bunch of people to call Jewish people. He's not talking to Gentiles here. So what are the ramifications of that? I don't know. How many people want to test that? You can sit there. We're going to have a theological discussion and one say, Lord, you know, that's a waste of time. Make sure you're saved. You know, God's grace is enough to cover our sins, and I understand that. But if you're living that kind of lifestyle and don't care, you're in danger. Because who knows if you're even saved? Do you follow me? I don't have time today to get into all that. But do you at least see that we need to take it seriously? Jesus wouldn't be saying it if it wasn't serious. Why does Jesus say that? Because he loves us. It sounds hateful. It's not hateful. If he was hateful, he would have destroyed the earth by now. For God so loved the world that he gave Christ, right? He, he wants none to perish. He desires for us to be saved. But there is right and there is wrong and there is consequences. Next week, 
we're going to talk about a very uh, controversial subject about homosexuality. What does the Bible have to say about it? We will come with it with a point of grace and a heart of love. But we need to talk about these things. Why? Because it's happening around us. The Bible has a lot to say about sexual relationships because he designed it and knows what's best in it. He says, if your right hand causes you to do it, cut it off. So it's very important that we get rid of this. Why is that so harsh? Because love protects. When you hear what's going on with ISIS around the world, or better yet, when you hear what happened with Hitler in the 1930s before uh, when he started raising the power, a lot of us said, ah, I'm not going to worry about it. But if you don't take care of evil, evil will take care of you. If you don't take care of evil, evil will take care of you. So we got to deal with these issues before they deal with us. We need to have preemptive strikes upon evil, which we're going to get into which are, for the rest of our time here this morning. Pretty much we're going to be talking about premeditated holiness. Premeditated holiness. How many of you have er ever heard of premeditated murder? Right, what happens? First degree. The person that thinks about it, they plan it, that's the highest, highest penalty comes to, to premeditated murder. Well, I may tell you this. If you want to be pure in this life, you have to have premeditated purity decisions. Life is a series of choices. You make your decisions, and your decisions make you. Let me say that again. You make your decisions, and your decisions make you. So it's very, very important that we make decisions prior to getting into the action. It's very important that we make decisions before we face situations, or else we're going to be playing catch-up and defense the whole time. And I wanted to stop here for a moment because you can get really discouraged when I'm saying for several reasons. Because often you come to church, it says, okay, give your life to Jesus. Then we give you this huge book. This book is, all, this, this book is do not do. That's the whole book. Do not do. Don't have fun. Don't watch movies. Don't have friends. Don't, have, you know, don't enjoy life. Just grin and bear it until Christ comes back. And we, that's sometimes how we feel. And what happens to us, and this is what's happened to me, imagine going on a soccer field. And, and you're the coach. Guys, we have, a, we have a game today. The whole objective is don't let anyone kick the ball in our net. Okay? You need to protect that. You need to watch out for getting kicked in the shin. You could hurt yourself. You could break your bones. You could dislocate your hip. You be very, very careful. Uh, the whole objective, we've got to protect ourselves and protect that goal. And, and, and you don't talk to them at all about scoring. It's just defense. What kind of soccer team would that be? Can you imagine, oh my gosh, I might get myself hurt, and i got to watch out for the goal. And So many of us live our lives, oh, I can't, I can't drink, I can't do this, I can't go out with people, oh, I've got to watch out for the enemy. Oh, the enemy, uh, he's a roaring lion, seeking who to devour. What, what am I supposed to do? And you walk around scared, and you walk around like a, like a cat that's scared, or a dog in the thunderstorm. With, you're walking around, you know, you're scared of life. That's not how we're supposed to live. You see, if we try not to sin, guess what happens? You sin. You absolutely sin. I was just talking to Ken. Ken, yesterday, I, I saw him at the gas station pumping gas, and he was had, running his motorcycle. I hope you don't mind mentioning that. And I talked about how I took a spill in the parking lot, and he was giving me a little instruction. He said, you got to look to where you go, not where you don't want to go, or else you'll spill your bike. I said, I'm done with bikes. And he's absolutely right. If you look, I don't want to sin. Uh, boom. But if you look where you want to go, you see, God has made us for vision. He's made us for vision, not trying not to get in trouble. So, how much better is it as a soccer team, using soccer as an example, because most of you had your kids in soccer at one time or another, or played soccer, the objective now is to score. I'm going to win this game. And I, have, I also need to defend my goal. But my goal is not just to defend, my, my goal is to win. My friends, we're created to win in Christ Jesus. We're created to have a goal to go for. We have, we're created for a purpose and a reason. That's why we're having 301 advertisement. We're going to help you find your, your purpose in life. If you don't have a purpose, you wander around. When you realize why you're created, I'm here to, to bless God. And I'm here to do things for God. I don't have time. I'm here to, to love my wife, to love my children, and to build the best church that, ex, that reflects Christ I possibly can by his help. That's my job. I don't have time to run to a bar. I don't have time to look at pornography. I don't have time to flirt with other people that are not my wife. Why would I want to do that? I got a mission. I got a place I got to go. That keeps me on track. If I don't do that, then you start getting all oh, the... You are made for battle. You're not made to try not to get hurt. You're made to fight. And when you're fighting, you win. 
Then if the enemy comes, you deal with him. But if you're looking for the devil, oh my gosh, the devil's after me. Oh, the Holy Spirit said this. I hear people all the time. You say, the devil made me do that. The Holy Spirit said that. Stop blaming the devil. Stop blaming the Holy Spirit. Take responsibility. Go be obedient to what God tells you. The Holy Spirit will give you direction. And when the enemy comes, you can deal with him when he comes with you. But don't look for the devil. He'll be coming anyhow. Okay? So you have to make a premeditated decision for holiness. You make your decisions and your decisions make you. I want to hear you say that. You make your decisions and your decisions make you. Let's make preemptive decisions before him. Let's prepare. You know, if, if, like I love what uh, Roosevelt said, his foreign policy uh, back with, with South America, he says, walk, walk softly and carry a big stick. You know, peace through strength. His military, they all know, you don't mess with the U.S., you mess with the U.S., you're going to get your head chopped off. And that's that. People were afraid of us. Why? We had a strong, we were prepared. We, we trained. In basketball, you train to dribble the ball so you can put it into the basket. All the training allows you, when the time comes, you know how to act. But if you just wait for it to happen, well, whatever happens, happens. Then you're going you're to be living catch up for the rest of your life. You don't win by playing defense. You win by playing offense. And that's how life is in Jesus Christ as well. So we have a firewall between here and there. And apparently, uh, we went through a little bit, of, I'm not going to tell you all the logistics, but the fire marshal, who we've, who we've grown to love, <laughs> God bless his heart. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. But he said, you need to put a firewall there. What happens is there's a certain amount of firewall, give a certain amount of time that it burns so they can come with the hoses and put out the fire. There's protection. You and I need to build firewalls around our hearts. And today we're going to talk more about that, making decisions and all that. Premeditated holiness. Training for right living. I love what it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 8, or 10, 13, 10 11 through 14. It says, now do these things happen to them as examples. And they were written for our abomination, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. He's talking about the Israelites. All the things that took place in Scripture are object lessons God gives us. It actually happened, but it's also an object lesson. It's like when little Johnny, don't put your hand on the stove. Little Johnny puts his hand on the stove and burns his hand. Next time, Johnny goes, I want to play in the street. Little Johnny, do you remember what happened when I told you for your own good, don't put your hand on the stove? Yes, Mommy. Yes, Daddy. Okay, what happened to you? I burned my hand. Okay, now we're telling you not to play in the street because it's like putting your hand on that. Oh, I get it now. Okay, well, that's what the Bible does with these old stories. They're true stories, but they're also surgeries, object lessons. And he says, therefore, this is important. Verse 12, therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. One of the things, I, I don't know where I got this from, but I like it, and I think it's true. He who thinks he can never be a fool is the true fool. He or she who thinks they can't be a fool is truly a fool. You see, you have to realize that you and I have a propensity to be foolish. And because you know that, you watch out for it and do the right thing. And the Bible says right here, no temptation has overtaken except as common to man. We're going to go back to that in a second. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Therefore, my beloved, flee idolatry. I love what it says here. No temptation is overtaking you, except what is common to man. Often, we think we're the only one going through a sour marriage. We think the only one struggling with different vices. The Bible says it's common to man. If it's common to man, it means you can learn from others. Why do you think God gives us the body of Christ? What do we have small groups for? So you can get to know people, have a relationship. And, you know, chances are someone else uh, went through trouble in their marriage, and they got through it. And so the common to man, hey, what happened to you? How would you have such a great marriage? Well, it wasn't always so great. Let me tell you what happened. Oh, wow, I'm encouraged now. Okay? It's common to man. Uh, if, for example, if you want to have a healthy marriage, don't hang out with people that are filing for divorce. Please, don't do that. Okay? Don't hang out with people that complain about their spouse. Find somebody or people that have healthy marriages and say, can I take you to lunch and I'm buying. You know? Uh, I can, can I buy you a Starbucks? Okay, whatever you have to do. And, and take them out. I'm going to buy you a Chipotle. Okay, whatever it is. I, I'm just giving endorsements. Find people that are successful in those areas. And if you have a good marriage, it's not just for you. It's to be an example to other people. Right? So why not learn from other people? Don't hang out with people that are doing terrible. 
You don't hang out, someone that's found bankruptcy, you don't ask them to help you do your taxes. That's just stupid, right? Someone that's uh, going to divorce lawyers every two years, you don't ask them for matter of advice. Find people. That's why the God sent us the church. Some of you are blessed. Some of you raised great kids and they're doing great. Why not find somebody that's been successful and being I do that. I find pastors that are very successful, at least in the area that I see them successful. They have good home lives. Their churches are flourishing. The people are growing in Christ. I, I, I don't hang around people that are closing their doors. Oh, those church, churches can't grow in New England. It's, you know, it's the chosen frozen. I don't have time for you. You go ahead and hang out with the other losers. I serve a winning God. All right? Come on. So why not find out with people that are doing well? There's no jobs in Connecticut. Okay, go hang out with the losers. I'm going to find people that have a job. And I'm going to find a job. Why? Because I believe I can. You know, God's going to bless me. Now, please, this is not a health and wealth message. But what it is is why not find people that are successful in God and learn from them? So common to man. So what does that tell us? The temptation you're going through, you're not the only one going through it. There's other people that struggle in marriages. There's other people that struggle with pornography. There's other people that struggle to be pure. So why not find people that have been victorious in that area? And the Bible says in James, confess your sins and one another that you may be healed. There's something about community. Okay? I don't have time to go further into that, but I think that's very significant. So since it's common to man, you can find help. So we need to set up walls of protection, firewalls. The first thing we have to do is we need to change our minds. Romans 12, 1 and 2. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. What you think about, you become. Even if it's a lie, you can become that. And so the Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, whatever is pure, whatever is holy, whatever honorable, think on these things. So what music are you listening to? You know, hot-blooded, check it and see, I got a fever of 103. I'm, I'm dating myself. Come on, baby. You know, so I have all these lyrics in my mind. Why not find something good at the cross? I, he gave it all for me. I mean, why not sing that, you know? Get your mind filled with the right thing. What you think about goes in your heart. What goes in your heart goes to your hands. And so the Bible says in Proverbs 23, 7, for as he thinks in his heart, so he is. Psalm 19, 14, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and redeemer. We need to make immediate decisions ahead of time. For example, what happens if the computer screen goes and says, looking for singles in your area? Click me. Well, I made a decision ahead of time that if that happens, I click off. All right? And so if you're looking at a website and you're saying, if pornography comes or an advertisement for that, I'm, I'm going to make a decision not to do it. Our pre I'm going to have a porn blocker on my site. I'm going to have my wife to have my passcodes, and she's going to see when I make preemptive decisions. So when it comes up, you've already made a decision. I don't negotiate with that. But well, what if it hap whatever happens, happens. Well, <laughs> if that's your idea, then it's like playing soccer without playing offense. You're going to get killed in the game. I don't know about you, but I want to win. So it's important that we make decisions. Uh, phones, for example. Or how about this? Facebook. Boop, boop. What's this? Remember me from high school, the girl you always wanted to date? Well, now I think you're kind of interesting. How are things going? Ooh. Wow. I'm not going to tell my wife. I'm not going to tell my husband. You see? What do you make a decision? I will not engage in relationships unless my wife knows what's going on. I'm not going to be in any relationship with a woman than, unless it's with my wife and it's done on a friendship basis. And I, and I don't even think, I'm not going to get into that right now. I think it's almost impossible to have, I don't get it. People have best friends. I, I, this, I'm going to meddle for a few moments. I, I don't understand how you can be married and your best friend is someone of the same, of the opposite sex. I don't get that. It's like my wife and I are married, but Susie and I were best friends. And that, that's just, I'm going to say something real spiritual. That's just flat out capital S stupid. It don't do that. Well, why? Because you're putting yourself, you're setting yourself up for failure. So don't get involved with that. Make decisions before that. The Bible says, watch and pray to avoid temptation. Uh, compromising situations, for example. I, I purposely do not hang out with women that are not my wife. If, if they could be seen as my, my contemporary, I don't, I don't do it. Why? Is my sexist? No, I'm smart. Because all, all has to happen, pastor touch me. I, I'm done. If, if I'm in the bathroom and a little boy comes in, I walk out. Why? One comment, I'm done. So I, I don't even want to put myself in a circumstances that could be seen as trouble because there's people out there trying to get you. And if I don't put myself in a set of circumstances like that, I don't get in trouble. 
Now, I understand this. I know some of you are in business, and sometimes you have to have business lunches. I understand that. But do yourself a favor. Keep it business. So you start talking about the sales team and how you're going to launch this campaign, to, to launch this new product. You're at, you're at lunch together with this young lady, and of course, and she's sitting across there looking good and smelling good, and you're looking good and smelling good. And, well, how, how you doing? I'm doing fine. Man, my marriage is on the rocks. Well, let's go back to the sales team. Okay, we're going to release. Don't even go there. You know, they call, say, I, I'll, I'll, let me call my wife. Hey, sweetheart, love you. You're, you sexy thing. <laughs> 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 I don't mess around. Don't mess around. I'm serious. Because, you know, Gary Chapman in a book called The Five Love Languages, he wrote a story about that in his book. talks about in love feeling. And uh, psychologists and psychiatrists say it lasts for about 18 to 30 months. It's that heartbeat, oh, my gosh, I've been touched by love. You know, the little bing, oh, I'm in love. The little Cupid has shot me with an arrow. Uh, just because you're attracted to somebody does not mean that's their one. Doesn't mean you've missed the boat. Guess what? You're going to be tempted. Uh, let me ask you another question. Have you ever been angry and driving a car and want to kill somebody? Do you, if you're angry at someone, do you murder them? No. Okay, if, you're, if you feel lust towards somebody, does it mean you act out? No. It's just part of being a human being. If someone, if someone splashes water on me, I might get wet. There's some people that push themselves on you, and you get, I'm like, whoa, okay, whoa, I'm going to stay away from that one. Ignore it. If that Facebook thing comes up, click. Oh, it's so good to see you. Hey, wonderful. Show your wife. Show your husband. Don't get involved with that. You get yourself into trouble. Uh, Jack Hayford, who I have a great deal of respect for, he pastored the church on the way in California, and also just a tremendous author, and just a guy that's been married to his, his, his wife for 60 years, just a tremendous man, a guy like my mom and dad, people of character. And he talked about a situation when he was in the um, district office for his organization, and he was married, he was following God, but there was this woman, they just got along so well. He was, she was just like his assistant. And they, they worked together, and they started finishing each other's sentences. I mean, they, they, they planned something, and she was amazing. And he just started, I said, I started looking forward to going to work so I could see her. And he said, I don't know. No, I'm, I'm sure I'm married. I love my wife. Then he had this feeling, which I thought was so interesting, because he said, I was wondering if God would set me up in case my wife dies. He's going to set me up with this woman. Now, don't tell me you never thought that before. Some of you have. I was like, Jack Hayford thought that? He was so refreshing. <laughs> And so he said, and he realized that was a deception. And so what did he do? He did nothing wrong. But he said, the anatomy of adultery was starting to happen. I was far from it, but that thought life. You see how the enemy does that? Maybe if I die, then maybe God's setting me up. So I better, you know, hedge my bets. And then you start putting arsenic in your wife's tea. No, I'm just. <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> Sorry, mom and dad, I apologize. <laughs> it's really hard when your mom and dad are here and your wife. <laughs> so make decisions ahead of time. Another thing, understand the times when you fall into sin, uh, when you're tired and stuff like that, okay? When you're tired. King David, um, when the Bible says when it was time to go to war, he stayed at home. He took a nap on the roof. And then he got himself into trouble. When you're, when you're idle time, when you don't have vision, when you're tired, look out. Make sure you get yourself in a situation not to get in trouble. Let's just go to the next one. Running out of time here. Um, and this is another one. Before you date, set limits. If you're single, set limits. Let you know what you will do when not do. Don't wait until you're in the heat of passion. That's not smart. Choose ahead. My wife and I, we chose to be pure. We chose we were going to do nothing that would embarrass any of you if you were with us. We made a decision ahead of time. We didn't wait until we're in the backseat of a Chevrolet next to a golf course to make a decision. We made a decision way ahead of the time that we would not be in the backseat of a car. First of all, the backseats are too small. Um, but we would not be in a golf course making out. We're going to be in, in acting correctly. Why? We didn't want to get ourselves in the situation. We made preemptive decisions that protected us. You need to do the same, being married or being single. You ever heard this before? The grass is greener on the other side? Yeah, the grass is greener wherever you water it. Wherever you water, it, the grass is greener. I found that out. I don't water my lawn. It's not very green. I've also found out where the, where the, where the, um, 
where the menorah is, it also gets green. And, and be very, very careful because, you know, it's very easy to get caught up in thinking about somebody else, someone else looks better, and all that kind of thing. You're only seeing a little bit of part of that person during the day. Be careful. Don't, the grass is not greener, only greener if you water. Start watering your own lawn and see what God will do with it. And another thing is this. I've heard people say this, and I know that I'm going to get myself in a little bit of trouble this morning, but I'm not afraid of that because God does forgive. But uh, have you ever noticed the chick flicks on Netflix, or chick flicks in general? I, I like chick flicks sometimes. And, you know, there's a book called The Notebook. I even, I get a little tear when I watch that one. Okay, The Notebook. But have you noticed in these books, they always had this, she's the one or he's the one. And they had this like, there's this like mysterious thing floating through the world and you're going to find the one. And so I've heard people say, well, I married him or her, but they weren't the one. I found the one. Uh, you know what? There is no one. What? I disagree with you. Oh, you disagree with me all you want. But how many folks know there's some people that are born today that were not planned by man, but God planned ahead of time? I, I know a great evangelist. His name is James Robertson. It was born of adultery, and he's a great evangelist. And he, what, what does it say? He's not legitimate because he, his, wife, his mother didn't have the one? No. Be the one to find the one. And so we can't believe that nonsense because do, does God lead you to certain people? Absolutely. But if you're married, that's the one. Don't say, oh, well, I have to find my soulmate. This is the wrong one. I've got to find the right one. In fact, I, I've heard people say, and I've, I've grown up and I've church and I've seen, I've heard a thousand sermons, fantastic sermons. <laughs> um, but from other people, I've heard people talk about, you know, the single people and I was single. You need, to find, you need to find your Boaz. I'm like, who's Boaz? And then you read about it in the book of Ruth. <laughs> Ruth, book of Ruth, she was widowed, her husband died, and she, she went to Naomi, and she worked hard, and she, she, was the, she was the right person. She did the right person, a character. And when you become the one, you find the one. But some people get themselves into trouble. And I got this quote a little while ago, I saw it, and I wanted to share it with you. It's kind of profound. But let's go, I'm going to put it up there, guys, if you put it up there. Um, Ruth patient, patiently waited. Ruth patiently waited for her mate Boaz. While you're waiting on your Boaz, single people, don't settle for any of his relatives. Broke as, poor as, lying as, cheating as, dumb as, drunk as, cheap as, locked up as, good for nothing as, lazy as, and especially his third cousin. Beaten your ass. <laughs> Wait on your bow ass and make sure he respects your ass. All right. <laughs> if, if I don't see you next week, I know what happened. I'm sorry, mom and dad. Go back to Jersey. I'm sorry about that. I think God has a sense of humor. Yes. That's why he made me. <laughs> Be the right one to find the right one. Very, very important. Don't try to change your spouse. You change yourself. You can't change your spouse. It doesn't work. Change yourself. Be the right one. Okay, so be pure. Single folks, listen to me. God has created you as a sexual being, but you're supposed to be pure. Married people, listen to this, that the only legitimate sexual expression your husband has, wives, is you. And wives, the only legitimate sexual expression you have is your husband. Make sure you fulfill that role so it doesn't have to be any other role. It's important that we cultivate a strong and vibrant and enjoyable sexual life in marriage. God made it. For, God made it. It's a great thing in marriage. It helps draw you close together. Be pure. And if you're single, God has made you. And I've never heard anyone dying from not having sex. Seriously. I need to have, no, you don't need to have sex. You need to have water, you need to have air, okay? And you need to be in church. <laughs> you don't need to have sex. You will not die. No one ever died not having sex. So that, don't, that's a lie. You don't need to have sex. You can be pure. So that's important to realize. Don't you feel like you learned a lot this morning? Let me just say one last thing as Stephen makes his way up. Stay in the light as he is in the light. If you could open your Bibles to 1 John 1, 6 through 10. And listen, if there's any dark areas in your, you see, mold grows in the dark. 
Sin happens in the dark. You should have a light on every area of your life. Don't have any secret places in your life. It's the secrets that get you in trouble. Now, I'm not saying you walk around telling them your problems. No, find select people that are accountable for various areas. You have people that are accountable for you with your finances. You have people that are accountable for you for your health. Have people accountable for you for your, your purity life. And by the way, when men don't have accountability partners in sexual purity with that's a woman, unless it's your wife. It doesn't work. Okay? Choose to be pure. Choose to be holy. Make preemptive choices. You make your decisions and your decisions make you. Make wise choices. And let's find a vision of four together. I love what the Word of God says here in 1 John 1, 6 through 10. This is Jesus, the beloved disciple, says this. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Think about that. When you're in a relationship and you have something that's secret, do you really want to hang out with someone that's living right? No. But if you're walking in the light, you want to hang out with people in the light. Verse 7, but if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. You see, we've all messed up, folks. No one is exempt here this morning from sexual brokenness of one sort or the other. We all have the brokenness. But let's walk in the light as he is in the light and have fellowship with each other. We're having small groups next door. It's just the beginning. It's not the end all, but why not invest and meet other people that can, you can have a relationship with, that you can pray for you. You're going through a difficult time. They can encourage you the right way. Be in fellowship with God. Be in fellowship with His people. Walk in the light as He's in the, in the light. And if we confess our sins, He's faith. You see, all of us have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Question is, are you ready? Have you given your life to Christ? Is He your Lord of all? You, know, you may believe in Him, that's great. But have you actually said, Jesus, you're it? I, I'm not the boss anymore. You're the boss. I believe you're God. You made me. I'm not going to do whatever I want anymore. I'm going to do what you say because I know you, want, you have my best in mind. I'm going to trust you. If you haven't done that, you're not saved. You believe, so what? So I want to give you an opportunity to pray, but I also want to say something else to you. The Bible says, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just and forgives us of our sins. Some of you are messed up big time. Maybe some of you right now are playing around on Facebook or flirting with somebody in the office or, or next door neighbor, whatever. My friends, stop it now. Get accountability. Don't let yourself be destroyed. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just. So I'm going to just sing, say a prayer. If you mean with your heart, it's a new beginning. Lord Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross for us. Not only do I believe you are the Son of God, I know that you paid for my sins. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And I choose this day to say, you are the master. You're the commander of my life. You're the Lord of my life. I don't call the shots. You call the shots. With your help and with your grace. I choose to follow you from this day forward. And some of those others of you, you're feeling guilty and you have sin in your life. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and true to forgive us of all of our sins. Father, we thank you that you have given us grace through your blood. And Father, I ask in Jesus' name that we would be preemptive in our battle to stay pure. Father, I pray that we would go after you instead of trying not to sin. We're going to go after you, Father, and be what you've called us to become. I ask your blessing upon this congregation, Lord, upon us, group of people. I pray that we be pure and holy. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. I'm going to ask the prayer team to make their way up. This is Stephen leads us in that one last song at the cross.